Aloha, this is News Behind the News, and I'm Maria Zimmerman. Welcome to the show. Today we want to thank Representative K. Mark Takai for coming on to share with us some of his stories from the legislative session this year, including what he accomplished for Hawaii's veterans and military, and also some insights on some things that are going on at the University of Hawaii, because he's a graduate there. Thank you for coming on the show. Oh, thank you for having me. It's really a great pleasure to get to know you, and I know a lot of people in Hawaii do know you because you, you're born and raised here and mm -hmm. went to school here, but maybe you can give us just a little bit of background on um, where you're from and sure. where you graduated from. Sure. Um, my family are products of the public school system. In fact, my sister uh, currently works for our alma mater. We graduated, all four of us, from Pearl City High School. I then went on to the University of Hawaii and got my bachelor's in political science and my master's in public health. Um, during the time when I was at the university, I um, uh, got involved in a few things. I was uh, a scholar athlete, so I swam for the university. Um, I was in student government. I was a uh, uh, student body president at one point. And then I also uh, uh, got involved in uh, student journalism. So I was editor-in-chief of the Kaleo. We took it from um, three days a week to five days a week. That was uh, probably one of my most memorable jobs. That's a big production. It is to put out, and yeah. especially because probably then there wasn't as much, I know when I worked earlier in a newspaper, you know, there's more like pasting things down and that kind oh, of stuff. Oh yeah, it's very different. Uh, back then we, we were still on linotype. Uh, we were transitioning to uh, desktop publishing, um, but all of our work was translated into uh, what we then got and then we had to, to cut. In fact, when I first started at Kaleo, it was still on the manual typewriters and we had 60 character lines, two and a half uh, lines per per inch and you know everything meant something a pica and a m space and all of those things really meant something nowadays everything is done on desktop publishing so uh, it's uh, what you see is what you get what they say yeah definitely oh I remember those days those are bringing back oh, some yeah. memories but I call you the number one UH fan because you certainly deserve it you not only were the student body president and worked for the newspaper and headed the newspaper and, and had in were in athletics as well mm -hmm. But now you're really dedicated. You go to a lot of the games and so sure. on. Sure. Yeah. Um, I think uh, you know when you uh, when you have received your education through a uh, scholarship through the university athletic program. I think uh, you owe it to your alma mater to continue to support um, the program. So after I graduated um, as a letter winner, um, I continued to support UH athletics and. Uh, this year, I'm the president of the UH Letter Winners Club, which is a, a group of um, former uh, scholar athletes who um, decided to continue to give back. So you were actually recently in the news, your group was recently in the mm -hmm. news because of the issue over the University of Hawaii uh, Warrior mm -hmm. versus Rainbow Warriors. What was that all about? Well, you know, um, it's a very difficult issue because, you know, we are created to support athletics and to support the athletic director. and. Uh, our organization struggled. In fact, we had a great meeting with uh, Ben Jay in January when he talked a little bit about his vision and uh, we spoke briefly about the, uh, the nicknames and he had mentioned to, to us that it was kind of a, a work in progress that would take many, many months, if not years, uh, to come up definitively with a plan. Uh, shortly thereafter, I think about two weeks later, he came up with a public pronouncement that the nicknames were changing. And for people who don't know him, because he is relatively new to Hawaii, he's the new athletic director. That's who correct. Who replaced Jim Donovan. Right. right? He, uh, he came from Ohio State mm -hmm. uh, as the associate athletic director and, and moved in as the head of athletics for um, the university, kind of the tail end of last year. So it was a big surprise year. to hear that news, huh? It was, uh, you know, because we had thought that we would have a number of different times to, to discuss and deliberate. Uh, you know, people are passionate about UH athletics. and. In this particular case, for the letter winners, many of our members are are uh, longtime, uh, you know, uh, supporters of the program for decades, and you know, some of them um, really strongly believe in the rainbows and the rainbow warriors and the rainbow wahine and stuff. So, um, you know, we had a discussion in in uh, February, and the board made a decision to send a letter to the athletics director and. I cautioned them against it because I just didn't, didn't think it was necessary. We could kind of work together and figure this out internally because I, I felt that it was an internal issue uh, within uh, the athletics department and we could work this out. Unfortunately, uh, two months later, there was no resolution. The board in um, April uh, made a decision to go with the letter and, 
you know, I, I, I tried to work it for two months internally and was unsuccessful. So May 1st, we sent that letter out. And, um, you know, it, it caused uh, quite a stir. And then he ended up actually changing his mind and sticking yeah. with Rainbow Warriors, right? <clears throat> yes. Yeah. So, so Ben, uh, you know, um, to his credit, uh, made the decision to change uh, the nicknames for the men's sports to Rainbow Warriors and to keep the Wahine sports to Rainbow Wahine. Um, he says publicly that, you know, a whole bunch of different things kind of came together and he made the decision. But, you know, from my perspective, uh, the, the right decision was made and we can go on to bigger and better things more important things like budgets and winning and you know supporting athletics that's good that's good well mm -hmm. that's nice I thought that was a good sign that uh, he listened to you right. even though at first it didn't seem like he did and then he did so that was good um, sign for the future of the athletics department mm -hmm. which has had many many challenges yes uh, it's been a very tough year in fact uh, when I became uh, second vice president three years ago you know I was looking forward to a uh, exciting year as president it's been it's been a struggle yeah. I, I took over in uh, in July and thankfully I'm done June 30th so right around the corner I'm, I'm gonna hang it up and transfer the presidency to somebody else. Well you have a lot of obligations you um, have first of all let's talk about just for a minute you have two kids. Yes uh, um, our uh, two kids Matthew and Kyla. Because you don't want them to see the show and you haven't mentioned them because you'll be in big trouble right? Uh, yep 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 <laughs> so you know not only is my family uh, my brothers and sisters uh, public school educator but my wife uh, comes from Mauna Loa. She graduated mm -hmm. from Mauna Loa and went to the university. In fact, we met at the university in ASUH. Um, but our children, our, our two children are now uh, uh, going to um, an elementary school, public elementary school in IAEA, and uh, we continue to support the public schools in our, in our community. Good, okay. So um, you have been, tell us a little bit about, you know, when did you run for office, and, and then we can talk about your military service, if that's okay. Yeah, um, in 1994, uh, Senator Tung Palan uh, decided to retire. Uh, then Representative David Ige decided to take her place and run uh, for the Senate seat, and it opened up an opportunity. Um, I've always wanted to represent uh, IAEA Pro City, and this was, you know, from my perspective, a chance of a lifetime. So uh, we ran in 94, and fortunately, uh, we, we won. And uh, ever since then, we've been running, and fortunately for us, winning. So it's been uh, 10 elections. Uh, uh, this uh, marked the, my 19th year, and uh, still having a lot of fun. The House has to run every two years. Yep. That is exhausting. Yep. I've been fortunate uh, over the past uh, few years, 12 years, in fact, uh, to run on a pose. So oh, okay. uh, I was fortunate over a, a span of 12 years in the middle of my career not to have an opponent. So then you must be doing a good job because they don't want to put up anybody to challenge you, huh? Uh, I don't know. All I know is I had a tough race the last time. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, uh, it was an exciting race, um, oh, but we, we, we came out. Great, okay. So now you have um, been involved in different committees, mm -hmm. and right now I know you chair the uh, Veterans um, and Military Affairs right. Committee, but what other committees do you serve on? <coughs> this year, mm -hmm. um, I currently serve on higher education and education, mm -hmm. and then I chair the Committee on Veterans, Military Affairs, I mean, Veterans, Military, and International Affairs and Culture and the Arts. And we shortened that for, on your title on right, the show right, because right, it would have right. been, we would have had to have like a much wider <laughs> screen to put it all. Yeah, actually or it, it was three separate ten. committees that they combined. Oh, okay. But, it, you know, it's been my passion to focus on the military and veterans for many years now. And in fact, for the last 10 years, I've always wanted to chair this committee. So it's a dream that I've had for many years. And, uh, you know, I've been working hard uh, just to address uh, the concerns that we've seen over the years mm -hmm. um, and uh, hopefully uh, we can continue to do more work next year. Now tell us what um, do you where do you serve in the military and you were deployed in 2009 right? Yes yeah, so in 1999 um, I decided to get into the Army National Guard so the Hawaii Army National Guard and uh, uh, joined as a preventive medical officer uh, with my background in public health and uh, since then I've been a uh, uh, really uh, uh, enjoying myself in in the Hawaii Army National Guard. Uh, currently, I serve as a uh, assistant to um, the, the personnel officer. Uh, so we focus on uh, maintaining some of our uh, officer files. But more importantly, uh, we, we take care of uh, casualties and, and focus on education as well. So that's what I'm doing now. Uh, in the past, I've, um, I've commanded the medical unit out of the brigade. And uh, uh, in 2009, I, I deployed with the the brigade um, to uh, 
Iraq and Kuwait uh, for me and the guys that I deployed with. We were in uh, southern Kuwait, and I um, basically ran a camp under Colonel Lesher. Uh, he was the base, uh, <coughs> the camp commander. I ran the camp under him as the camp mayor, um, and it was a lot of fun. A lot of work, a lot of stress, uh, but you know, one of those opportunities that I, I would do again. And you missed that session, or was it the next session? I can't remember. And yeah, then so came I deployed, back. I deployed um, in February of 2009. So I came in for maybe about five days, and then I got put on active duty. And then I came back in uh, September or August of that year. So I missed the remaining uh, part of the 2009 session, mm -hmm. um, came back for the 2010 session. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it was a it was a substantial deployment, but it took you away just for part of uh, part of the one most of the one. Yeah, session. most yeah, mm -hmm. probably like fifty days. So mm -hmm. it was mm -hmm. And you usually have sixty working uh -huh. days, right, uh -huh. in the legislature for right. people that don't follow that closely. Right, right. Okay, so one of the best things I think you probably probably everybody would agree that one of the best things that uh, you helped start or you did start at the at the legislature was the Medal of Honor ceremony, mm -hmm. and it is absolutely just heartbreaking, but it's also so important. Maybe you can explain to people about that and why you started it. Yeah, so in 2004, um, I was then vice speaker, and I talked to uh, then speaker Calvin Say, and we wanted to do something profound uh, in light of the fact that this was going to be our first deployment of our Hawaii Army National Guard Brigade since Vietnam. Um, so we thought that, you know, why don't we recognize uh, the service members who we uh, lost. Now, we had already lost some, some people with Hawaii ties. Hawaii ties means you're born and raised in Hawaii or you serve with a unit uh, from Hawaii or you're part of the Hawaii Army or Air National Guard. And uh, we decided to go with this medal. And then we struggled with the name, but I had a chance to talk with um, Senator Inouye and he uh, supported the effort to name the, the medal, the Hawaii Medal of Honor. And uh, we, f we gave out our first uh, medals in 2005 um, after the brigade, uh, I'm sorry, 2006 after the brigade got back. And, uh, you know, we've been doing it every year uh, since. And uh, this year we awarded our 327th medal. And uh, as I mentioned, this is uh, people with Hawaii ties, uh, people that have come through Hawaii or call Hawaii, called Hawaii home. Um, for, for however long, you know, whether they were born and raised here or they were stationed here. Uh, it was a very unique award when we first started it. Uh, many of the people uh, come from very far away, and they would say, and they continue to say, that they appreciate um, the state of Hawaii and our gesture and, and, and the medal itself uh, because their own home state doesn't do this. Now, since then, um, Alaska picked it up, uh, New Hampshire, and then Minnesota is the fourth state to, to do something. And, I'm hoping that one day all the states will, will recognize uh, service members who are killed in action, uh, dying to defend uh, our freedoms. Uh, but we're, we're the first, and uh, you know, we take pride in that. Unfortunately, as we heard recently, uh, we, we have had some um, recent casualties, and unfortunately, we're going to be doing it again next year. Mm -hmm. Well, I know it's very heartbreaking when you see the children mm -hmm. come in and get the medal for their father or their mother, and it is a it's very, very heartbreaking. Very, there's not a dry eye in the yeah, house. That's right. Yeah, yeah. It's but uh, it's important for them to get that recognition. Yeah. So you know, it's interesting because I have a chance to meet with every single family, mm -hmm. and at the very beginning of the ceremony, actually before we start, I tell them we're going to take pictures. Mm -hmm. You're going to get bombarded by interviews, possibly. If you have uh, problems with that, let us know. But I want you to know that one of the reasons uh, why we do this is to capture the moment. And then, then you can tell your loved ones f for generations from now what happened. And, and because of that, we're going to take pictures. And uh, you know, I think some of the families don't appreciate that when it's happening. You know, it's a very emotional, emotional time. Um, however, you know, we still get calls from many people from the beginning uh, you know, we're the only contact that they have to Hawaii where their loved one was uh, lost and last stationed, and uh, they want to know what the weather is and how Hawaii is doing and things like that. So, you know, we, we, um, we tell them at this ceremony that um, Hawaii is a very special place, and, you know, we will not forget their loved ones. And not only do we register it into our journals in both the House and the Senate, uh, but we actually pass a, a concurrent resolution uh, 
going through both House and Senate. And then, as you know, the media picks it up pretty widely. So, and then um, it's also completely aired. The whole thing is aired live. That's correct. On Olelo, the it's, station. It's live. Uh, that's yes. correct. It's live. Uh, it's live on Olelo. Uh, it gets uh, it gets remastered on a DVD, and we send it to every single family too. And I know you and um, your assistant, and I remind me of her name. Lisa Vargas. Lisa Vargas. Mm -hmm. She does, and you work together uh, diligently <coughs> to make sure every family, yeah. or, or as close as you can get to family, co is contacted. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yes. And then also they receive the medal if they aren't able to accompany. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Yes. So and it's, it's a lot of work. I mean, mm -hmm. it's a year-long process. Yeah. Now, what about some of the other issues? What were some of the top issues that came up this year for veterans and military affairs when you chaired that committee this year? Yeah, so what we wanted to do was we wanted to recognize, uh, in this case, the, um, the spouses of service members. You know, they, tra they transfer and travel to many places, and many times it's every three years they move. And we have spouses that are um, highly educated, uh, some with uh, degrees and licenses from other states. So what we did this year uh, was create a law that allows a spouse uh, to practice whatever he or she is, you know, whether it's, uh, it's a profession like a doctor or a dentist or nurse or, or a truck driver or whatever, you know, um, for a short period. Uh, we, we made it no longer than five years. We believe that we, we capture 99.9% .9 of the spouses. Um, but we, uh, we did this uh, because not only do we believe that you know, being in the military is difficult and uh, having a family that moves place to place is difficult, but we want to um, recognize the expertise of our service members and their spouses. But more importantly, I think we can utilize their expertise for ha however short uh, duration they're in Hawaii. So we passed that, which was um, something that's very important. In fact, uh, the president and uh, first lady talked about it and had had a big press conference in Maryland to talk about what Maryland did. Uh, we we do things in Hawaii quietly, uh, but with profound impact. So we're we're very supportive of the military and in this particular case, the spouses. I'm sure they'll appreciate that because I know there's always challenges coming here. At one time, it was bringing your pets here mm -hmm. um, through all the process that they had to go through through. Um, I guess uh, four months or three months of waiting, and then I know there's always other adjustments, finding schools and things like right. that. So it's great to know that the spouses can just keep continuing to work in their profession. Yeah, and we've been hearing, you know, over the years, some concerns from the military about education in our schools, and and I, I just think that that's just kind of um, uh, tales that just are uncontrollable, you know. And I think from my perspective, we're, we've been doing quite well. In fact. Uh, we're part of the Interstate Compact uh, for Education and Military Children, and I believe 46 states are now doing it. We were in the first, uh, well, we, we adopted it the second year, so I think we're the 14th state. And uh, that allows for, um, for children to transfer and to move unfettered between states that have uh, signed onto the compact. And in fact, um, our current state commissioner um, is not only the leader of our state, um, structure in Hawaii, but she's also the national leader, uh, um, Dr. Kathy Berg from the University of Hawaii, who's a retired Brigadier General. So uh, we're very proud of uh, the, the, the um, advancements and the support that we provided to our military children. Years ago, maybe about uh, 15 years ago, I, I created that focus, and I've been working hard um, on that, uh, focusing on educating military children. In fact, uh, one of the proudest moments that I have uh, was working on this, um, what we call an obscure provision in federal law that uh, the state of Hawaii wasn't partaking in. The first year we thought we had generated, and this was internal, my office compiling all the data, working with the uh, private housing officials, we had thought we generated about three million. In fact, it was six million. So over the course of uh, five years, we uh, brought in over 30 million to the state. Wow. Um, and that's just with developing partnerships, not only in the state, um, but also throughout the nation. I know I worked at Holy Family for a while, which is mm -hmm. a big military, you have a lot mm -hmm. of military children that come in there because it's near the base. Right. So yeah, we got to meet a lot of the families that uh, were coming through Hawaii and getting a good education, whether it was at Holy Family right. or a public school right. nearby. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the other um, bills that came up this year, issues that came up? You had, I saw everything from supporting military families like you were talking about to the um, anti-ballistic missiles to um, talking about uh, 
you know, the National Guard and so on. So what were the main <coughs> things that you thought were important? Yeah, we, we've, we've passed a number of measures. In fact, some of my colleagues said we overworked the, the committee because uh, the committee had, had done a lot and probably uh, this year passed out the most measures uh, in, a, um, in, in uh, military. Um, but I think uh, our proudest accomplishment was in the budget. Uh, we put in uh, working with uh, Representative Luke, who's the Chair of Finance, and uh, Senator Ige, Chair of Ways and Means. Uh, we put in some significant funding. Um, one of the things that um, we, uh, we did many years ago and uh, we'd like to continue moving forward is we supported people coming into the National Guard with tuition, tuition assistance. You know, many people that joined the Guard joined because they were promised um, a college education. Unfortunately, uh, when times got tough, we eliminated that provision. But this year, we added a quarter million uh, to the budget so we, we can provide uh, tuition assistance to, to especially the, the new uh, Air and Army Guardsmen uh, coming into uh, the Guard. Um, so that's, that's a big plus because, um, you know, as the war uh, kind of settles down a little bit in the Middle East, um, the federal support, especially for tuition assistance and recruiting and retention, uh, tails off as well. So I think from our perspective, being that the National Guard is a state militia, we had to uh, beef, up some, beef up some of our incentive programs, so we did that. In addition, uh, there's a, a, a ton of money in um, uh, facilities build out. So we're, we're relocating the aviation facility from uh, Wheeler down to Kalailoa, which is now the headquarters for the Army Guard. Um, we just had a groundbreaking of the uh, brigade, the new brigade headquarters. So uh, we had to put some state monies in to match the federal support. Uh, so that's, that's been good as well. And then the other thing that uh, we, we have supported over the years and continue to support, it's, it's both education and military, is the Youth Challenge Program. Um, you may know that the Youth Challenge Program in Kalailoa was our first one and has continued over many years, in fact, a couple decades. We just started the one on the Big Island, um, but the decision was made to move it from the prison uh, to the armory, and we needed some funding there, so we put the funding into the budget. So that's all good stuff. That's a very good program. I've done stories on mm -hmm. that program in the past, and mm -hmm. a lot of success stories, and the kids seem much happier than they had been yeah. before getting in there. Yeah, actually, uh, we, we totally support that program. In fact, uh, I, uh, for 10 legislative sessions, hired a graduate from the Youth Challenge program, and they did front of the office kind of things, uh, uh, from answering the phones to managing my calendar and, and mail. Uh, but nonetheless, it was many times their first job. Yeah. Uh, you know, and they needed to do that. They have a requirement after graduating from the Youth Challenge program to get a job. So it was my way of helping that program out. Now, what about some of your, all of your bills have to be approved by the governor. Mm -hmm. Either he can either mm -hmm. veto them, pass them, or let them go without his signature right. and become law. Mm -hmm. So what is your status of the bills? I know he's just getting a lot of these bills um, right, right. to review. So Actually, he signed some of them already. Uh, but I believe he has until the ending of June, uh, beginning of July, to, to make the final decision. So I suspect over the next few weeks it'll get hot and heavy in terms of his review and, and hopefully signing them all. Mm -hmm. Well, he should be supportive because of his background in Congress in terms of helping veterans and so on, right? Yeah, so I, I've, worked, yeah, I've worked very closely with Congressman Abercrombie when he was uh, the chair of the subcommittee on air and land. Uh, he oversaw um, the budget for the Air and Army National Guard as well as the active duty forces. Um, so he's, he's well aware, I think, of um, the benefits and the contributions of our military and military families. Now, I don't know if, you, if you're up for it, but the, the other committee you mentioned that you're on is the education mm -hmm. and higher education. Mm -hmm. So that's um, basically the high school and lower versus college, right? Mm -hmm. And high, well, at college and beyond. So maybe some of the, you know, this has been a hot topic um, this year about the University of Hawaii, mm -hmm. and uh, we only have about three and a half minutes left, mm -hmm. but maybe you can tell us what are some of the bills, because you've introduced some bills um, this year and actually every year to try to reform some of the, the programs or funding at UH. Tell us about that. Yeah, actually, we need a couple hours to talk about Yeah, I about know. UH, we'll have another show on that. Yeah, <laughs> let, let me just, uh, um, just briefly tell you some of the things that I believe moving forward is important. Mm -hmm. as, as you are well aware, Marcy Greenwood has decided to step down, and uh, we have an opportunity. Uh, for many years, I've, I've supported uh, or requested the Board of Regents to take a look at the, the structure of the university to see if, in fact, there could be some changes. 
every time there's an opening at the highest levels, I bring this up. And I think there's another opportunity for the board to take a look at the structure, whether it's to bring together the Manoa Chancellor and the President, like it had been during President Mortimer's uh, tenure, or to make uh, other adjustments. Uh, the fact is that once the two um, offices were split, they, um, they, they said that it wasn't going to cost anything, but actually in uh, reality it's costing about $6 million a year. Um, and over the last 10 years, that's $60 million. That's a lot of money. So I'm asking the board to take a look at that. And you know, if they, if they decide to keep it the same, that's fine. But we have a golden opportunity right now to take a look at that. The second thing that I've um, advocated over the past uh, few years is I think that there's just a challenge uh, for people coming from out of state to understand Hawaii as a whole, but more importantly, the University of Hawaii specifically. Um, so I think that uh, moving forward, at least on an interim or a temporary basis, the, the new president needs to be someone that has some ties to Hawaii. Just to um, not having to go through this education process, which I believe takes like a couple of years to figure out how Hawaii works. Uh, we don't have that type of time. We got to get past that and then start making decisions. So I, I prefer, and I mentioned this to the chair of the board, um, that they take a look at someone interim and maybe hire them for a couple years and make some of the tough decisions and then make way for a permanent uh, president. But right now, I just think that uh, you know there's just a lot that has happened over the last couple of years. And we need to bring in some stability. And I'm hoping that the new leader, the next president, can do that. Well, certainly, we saw good results with David McLean when he was in there. Yes. And he had come from within the system. He was yeah. the head of the business department, I believe. Yep. In fact, he's still there. He's still a oh, professor. Okay. Um, you know, Unfortunately, uh, you know, people remember only when the media comes and, 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 and they see me engaged in the university when the times are really tough. I mean, you go back to Dobell, and I was in the center of that as the chair of uh, higher ed. Um, but you know, what I tell people is that over the years, even uh, during the tenure of um, uh, President Ewan and President McLean and President Mortimer and even President uh, Simone, you know, I, I worked very closely with those gentlemen, and we had some great times. But people only remember, you know, the last presidency with Marcy and my relationship with her, and, and to some, maybe some Dobell. But you know, I, I bleed uh, UH green and black or white or whatever it is. <laughs> whatever colors but, they decide uh, to make it. You right? know, I, I, <laughs> I owe a lot to the university, and I care deeply about um, our university system, our ten campuses uh, that comprise of the system, and uh, I will forever advocate for what's best for the university. Great. OK, well, we're running out of time, so I want to show your website where people can get mm -hmm. more information and get contact with you. Uh, Representative MarkTakai.com? Or is it um, MarkTakai.com? MarkTakai.com. MarkTakai.com, OK. All right, well, we're already out of time, so I want to thank you for coming on the show, and I hope you get to come on again, and we'll talk on, on, you know, about some of the other issues coming up. Thank Thanks you Thanks for all much. your service. We thank appreciate you. it. Aloha. Aloha. This has been News Behind the News.